Specialty Story, session number 109. Whether you are a pre-med or a medical student, you've answered the calling to become a physician. Soon you'll have to start deciding what type of medicine you'll want to practice. This podcast will tell you the stories of specialists from every field to give you the information to make sure you make the most informed decision possible when it comes to choosing your specialty. Welcome to Specialty Stories. My name is Dr. Ryan Gray. If this is your first time joining me here on Specialty Stories, thank you for taking some time to listen. If you're a medical student, I would love for you to share this podcast with your medical school administration and or your private Facebook group or whatever group you have for your classmates who are in medical school with you. Share the love. I would appreciate it. Today, we have a great guest. We have Dr. Ed Uthman on the podcast today talking about pathology. And Dr. Uthman has been out of his training now for many years, and we talk about some of the changes that he's seen in medicine and pathology over those years. We start the discussion with how Dr. Uthman became interested in pathology to begin with. Uh, I guess I got interested in it uh, in the course of the basic science part of med school. Uh, I really enjoyed the pathology lectures probably more than most of the other disciplines. So I was drawn to it at basic sciences. Um, I really didn't consider it as a specialty until I got into clinical rotations. Um, I wanted to be an internist. That's pretty much the way I was headed. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I did a uh, some electives in internal medicine, and I did an elective in pathology, and I by far enjoyed the pathology elective a lot more. What was it that you liked about it? I would say there are two things. One of them is uh, somewhat um, probably superficial, but the one that's not superficial is that I, I just enjoyed the diagnostic part, the medical detective part of pathology, mm-hmm. a lot more than I did the treatment part. I thought the treatment part was just not that interesting. But the diagnosis I thought was fascinating, you know, like going on a journey to figure out what's going on with this patient. The superficial reason is I simply liked the attending staff in the pathology department a lot more than I did those uh, in the internal medicine department. It's really, you say it's superficial, but I, I think there's uh, there's a huge part of clinical training and mentorship that we don't really take into account as students are going through their their rotations of really who they click with that that draws somebody to a specific specialty, not necessarily for the medicine, but for the the people who are mentoring them. Yeah, I know. And, I, and it's, yeah, I'm sure you've encountered that in interviewees. A lot of people do choose, that goes pretty heavily into their choice of specialty. Yeah. So a lot of people think pathology and go, oh, you didn't like internal medicine. You chose pathology because you didn't like being around people. It's one of the big, I think, myths around pathology. What what do you say to people who think that or or that myth around pathology? Yeah, I'd say that's probably the biggest misconception about pathology. Um, you know, if you're a clinician, you obviously interact with your patients, uh, but you have this exalted position in the in your position in the doctor-patient relationship. But pathologists have to deal with a wide variety of personalities. Um, there are people that are that are our equals and our peers. Um, and uh, that's at least as challenging as um, instructing a patient what to do. So I think if somebody thinks that their, their lack of skills in, in interacting with people makes them well-suited to pathology, they're laboring under a misconception. Yeah. What traits do you think lead to someone being a good pathologist? I think you have to be really obsessive compulsive because you have to pay attention to details. Um, You have to be constantly aware of when you're making a diagnosis that Mother Nature is going to throw you a bunch of curveballs and try to force you to misdiagnose the case. And so you really can't afford to gloss over things. There's a lot of pattern recognition. You start off with pattern recognition and making diagnoses, but beyond that, there's a lot of attention to detail. When you're looking at, or when a student's looking at pathology, we, we've had uh, dermatopathology on, we've had forensic pathology. When I look at your specialty with uh, anatomic and clinical pathology, where where is that in the spectrum of pathology? Is that kind of the default route 
uh, or is that um, further training to be an anatomic and clinical pathologist? That's that's the general track. You uh, you do two years of anatomic and two years of clinical, and then you're a pathologist. You're what typically an American pathologist is. You're board. You become eligible to to uh, sit for the boards in both anatomic and clinical pathology. Uh, so forensic pathology that's considered a subspecialty. So they typically start off with the same certifications that I have, and they do a forensic pathology fellowship on top of that. Dermatopathology is a little different because you can go in by way of the dermatology or the pathology route. So if I wanted to be a, um, a dermatopathologist, I could do um, a residency in anatomic pathology followed by a derm path, or I could do a residency in clinical dermatology followed by the same uh, fellowship in derm path. Okay. Now you work in a clinical or a community-based setting. Uh, you used to be in an academic setting. What was the decision for you to be out in the community? I think that uh, I really enjoyed the teaching aspect of academic pathology. And if that's the result to it, that and, and doing the service work, I'd probably still be in it. But uh, there was an expectation of achievement in um, basic research. And I felt like, honestly, I didn't have the temperament or the talent to pursue something that narrow and that intensive. Uh, I'm really more of a generalist in the community practice where I'm the only pathologist in a hospital that's really just perfect for my personality and my skill set. How big of a hospital is it to only have one pathologist? It's a, it's a, um, well, we have, we're licensed for over 200 beds, but our census is considerably less than that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I get, I get specimens from the hospital, um, but I'm also part of a big group and I get some specimens from a commercial lab. So I get to see a wide variety of specimens from different venues. Okay. Interesting. What does a typical day look like for you? Um, well, if, if, um, if I don't have an early case on the schedule, I usually get in around uh, nine o'clock. Uh, I'll deal with any, I'm laboratory director, so I'll deal with any administrative problems that have occurred overnight that uh, they didn't feel necessary to call the on-call person about and um, put out those fires. Um, I'll oftentimes have some reference lab cases that came in the night before. I can um, look at those and diagnose reports uh, on those. Um, then the hospital, the slides from the hospital cases start coming in in late morning. I'll look at those, dictate the reports. And during the day, I can be interrupted um, with phone calls or to attend a biopsy in the radiology department. Well, I'll determine if the specimen they got was adequate and let them know right away so they can let the patient go with the minimum number of uh, sticks. Um, then in the afternoon around 3.30, um, the gross specimens that have come in all day have been logged in and I just um, go to the gross room and I dictate the gross descriptions on those. And then I'm usually out of here uh, about 5 p.m. Uh, if it's a light day, I can get it earlier. Sometimes I have to stay till seven. So it just depends on the workload and how complicated the cases are. Now for a student listening to this who may not understand, when you say gross specimens, what do you mean by that? So then when a physician or a surgeon takes out a stomach or a colon or whatever, or uh, a gastroenterologist clips out a biopsy, they send these bits of tissue to us, either a whole organ or little tiny pieces of tissue. And so the first thing we do is the gross exam. So we're looking at the specimen with the naked eye and describing it. And then we submit it or portions of it for processing for the microscopic exam the next day. Okay. Now, you talked earlier about when you come in, if you don't have any cases earlier in the morning, what, what does a case look like? Is that just you kind of being there with the surgeon, if the surgeon has something that they're doing? Right. If the surgeon has a case um, that looks like they're probably going to need an intraoperative consultation, I want to be there and available for that. What kinds of procedures would that be or pathologies would, would you need to be there for? Uh, some things like with an um, OB-GYN. 
is uh, going to do a hysterectomy and the patient has not had an endometrial biopsy beforehand, they'll do a DNC there on the table. And if the endometrium is benign on frozen section, they proceed with the hysterectomy. And if it's uh, an unusual case and it turns out to be malignant, then they have to do a, another operation or they have to refer the patient to a gynecologic oncologist. So it's the type of decision that has to be made while the patient's under anesthesia. That's that's when they need us there in the, in the OR. Now, are, are there any times where you're the one interacting with a patient doing any sort of biopsies or, or uh, procedures? Yeah, uh, I, I do frequently in my practice. Um, that's not true of all pathology practices, but in mine, yes, um, the radiologist will do a fine needle aspirate, which is a minimally invasive type of uh, biopsy where they just suck cells out of a lesion. We make a direct smear and stain it, look at it right away. And um, I'm able to tell the patient what the diagnosis is while they're still there on the table. Okay. What does call look like for you? Um, I'm part of a large group. So call is only like every, for one week out of 12. Um, so that's not too frequent. We do take it a week at a time. Um, we do get calls in the middle of the night. That does happen. It's not frequent, though. So I wouldn't, and we, we take call for four different hospitals because we're a big group. So there are quite a few phone calls and occasionally a trip in, you know, in the middle of the night. But I would certainly not let the call responsibilities dissuade me from going into pathology. That's not a huge part of it. My assumption is that the, the four hospitals that the group covers are all local enough to drive to? Or um, is there technology involved where slides are scanned and you can look at something through a, a computer? I suspect that's that's going to be the next generation of pathologists will get very used to that. As it is now, the slide scanning is in its infancy. So we still look uh, directly at the glass slides. Okay. Fun technology. Going to change everything. <laughs> it will. Yeah. What uh, do you... With with being on call as infrequently as you are and, and with the, the caseload being the only pathologist at your hospital, do you feel like you have enough time for a life outside of the hospital? Sure, sure. It's, it's, like, it's like being the owner of a small business in general. You know, you, you have a lot of flexibility. You don't, you're not punching a clock. You don't have to show up at any specific time or leave any specific time as long as you get the work done. So you in pathology, you can kind of move things around. And that's another thing that I like about it. The slides are going to be there whenever I come in, early or late. Whereas uh, if I were an internist, for instance, I'd have to meet clinic hours and I'd be paying um, clinical staff to maintain that clinic during those hours. I don't have to worry about any of that. So I feel very privileged that I have the kind of flexibility I have. What about for, for slides that are like a, a patient's waiting uh, to potentially be discharged or, or those types of scenarios? How, does, how do you take that into account? Well, if that, if, it, interestingly, that's not as big a decision point as it used to be. Uh, modern utilization um, practices have tried to get them away from that. They don't want to hold patients in the hospital waiting for results. They just want to hold patients in the hospital who are sick enough to be in the hospital. <laughs> so I've, I've seen that need kind of evaporate over my years in practice. But if there is a case where uh, an uncommon case where that decision point uh, is necessary, then we ask that they submit the specimen as a stat. We process it early and look at it first first thing in the morning. Okay. Now, you talked a little bit about the training path to become a pathologist, and we talked a little bit about forensic pathology. Are there other subspecialties in pathology for someone to, to further subspecialize? Oh, yeah, there's some, there's some great subspecialty opportunities in pathology. Um, of course, you've already talked about dermatopathology, hematopathology. My, my wife is a hematopathologist. Um, that's the diseases of the blood and the blood-forming uh, organs and lymph nodes and such. Um, there, if you go to a medical center, um, like a tertiary care center, pathology departments are ultra specialized. So they'll have sections of gynecologic pathology, and that's all those academicians look at are, are gynecologic uh, specimens. So there's all sorts of both formal and informal types of training programs to allow you to, to subspecialize. Dermatopathology is very popular. 
hematopathology, cytopathology uh, uh, is also popular. But but there there are things like neuropath, eye, even eye. You can specialize in eye pathology. Even. Wow. Now, for you, what was the decision to remain a generalist? I think it just fits my personality better. I like learning new things and reading a, a lot of a broad base of literature. And um, I get antsy if I have to get too focused on something for too long a time. Uh, so I enjoyed the, the 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 wide variety of challenges I get on a daily basis. And I constantly have my nose in a book looking things up that I'm encountering something I haven't seen before. Yeah. Now, for the osteopathic student listening to this, it's it's funny. I, I always make a joke about DOs in pathology about doing manipulation on slides um, yeah. as, as DOs are known uh, for their manipulation. But do you see any negative bias towards osteopathic physicians in the pathology world? Not at all. Um, and I would say that even goes in my area, which is the Houston area. Uh, I would say that there is no bias against DOs in any in, 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 of any fashion at all. Um, I I couldn't tell you in my group who's a DO and who's an MD. It's yeah. so irrelevant. They train in the same specialty. They train in the same residencies that the MDs train, yeah. and they're at least in my part of the country. There's totally equivalent degrees. Yeah. Good. Good to hear. For the future primary care doctors out there, or maybe surgeons or uh, OB guys that you'd be working with, uh, or they'd be working with path- pathologists in the future, what do you wish they knew to uh, they knew about what you're doing day in and day out to potentially help their patients and help you do your job better? I wish that they knew how much help we need in making our diagnoses how much the clinical information that they have helps us make the right diagnosis and can keep us from making the wrong diagnosis. Uh, sometimes I think we may have presented ourselves as too omniscient so that they think, think we can take a tiny bit of tissue and make a life-changing diagnosis. And in some cases we can, but in plenty of cases we need clinical information. And the more they give us, the less likely we are to screw up. <laughs> it's not like uh here's this here's this lump of cells tell me tell me what's wrong and what to do it's I, I need a whole clinical presentation as well that's right and specifically i would say to my colleagues in in primary care um skin biopsies without a really good dermatologic evaluation are of limited value hmm. so uh, especially biopsies of rash. So if somebody sends a punch biopsy of a rash um, and they don't have it narrowed down clinically to three or four possible entities, it's going to be garbage in and garbage out. Yeah. Um, and that, so, and, and I wish again, and, and, and then to my colleagues in dermatology, I wish that the training of, of medical students and primary care doctors in clinical dermatology were more more robust than it is. Okay. Good. Good to know. What other specialties or specialists do you work the closest with? Uh, Radiologists probably I'm literally the closest to because they're right across the hall. So to attend a biopsy, I just just walk right across the hall. Um, I hear a lot from gastroenterologists, um, OB-GYNs, general surgeons. Um, don't hear much from anesthesiologists. We don't, we, you know, we, we cross in the, in the lunch line and that's about it. Uh, but, but just any, 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 uh, physician that has a patient that needs biopsy or has some, uh, blood or body fluid sent for analysis is going to be fodder for the pathologist at some point. Yeah. Are there any special opportunities outside of clinical medicine for pathologists? Yes. In fact, uh, my wife's a good example. She uh, started off as an academic hematopathologist, and she's now an associate dean uh, at a medical school, and she's the DIO and responsible for all the postgraduate training programs. So there's definitely a a very, uh, there's a very uh, well-populated educational track in pathology uh, if you go into academic practice. Um, So I would say that definitely there's also probably some role in um, in regulatory functions mm-hmm. in peer review functions, but I would say the main track other than just 
just being a pathologist and doing regular pathology stuff is is getting into med school and being involved in the educational aspect. Do you see a big draw just with the way technology is going, a big draw from the tech industry to bring pathologists on board for for help with the machine learning, with new um, machine learning potential with pathology? I'm sure it's out there, but it's not anything I've had any um, personal experience with mm-hmm. or, or with people that I interact with regularly. That's that's being in the Houston area versus the uh, San Francisco area, right, probably. Right, probably so. Yeah. <laughs> what do you know now that you wish you knew before going into pathology? That's a good question. You know, I I, I thought about that question actually for some time. Uh, and I really, I haven't been blindsided by anything. I pretty much, it was, it, it turned out to be what I expected from the get-go. Yeah, uh, that's good. Or, I have no complaints about the choice of specialty at all. Good. What do you like the most about being a pathologist? I like um, interacting with people. Strangely, <laughs> you're a pathologist. You can't say that. <laughs> I know. I know. But that's it, but but that's the honest answer. Yeah. Um, and I guess I'm in a position where I could retire. I've been practicing since 1981. But I, honestly, I would miss the people that I work with on a daily basis a lot. And it would, it'll be a big loss when I finally have to leave. What's the biggest change you've seen over the, those years? Well, the, uh, the development of immunohistochemistry, which is a specialized technique in anatomic pathology, that's totally changed everything. Um, in terms of how we make diagnoses, it went from non-existent when I started practice to something that's completely indispensable now. Now, the next generation of pathologists is going to experience that in molecular pathology. So that's the next big um, horizon that we're going to we're going to head towards. And we're already seeing quite a bit of it, but it's going to be massive, massive change for the next generation. Cool. What do you like the least about pathology? Um. I guess I don't really like opening an unprepped colon. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if anybody I mean, would like that. I, yeah, I mean, I said that's really uh, it's the visceral stuff that I you know dislike the most. But it you know it's a, it's a, it's a minor complaint. I, I enjoy the specialty. I enjoy every day I come to work. I've had a good time every day. I've been in practice. Do you have any tips or tricks for um, reducing those smells with unprepped colon, either for the future pathologists or, or the medical students when they're in the uh, anatomy lab? Yeah, I would say that, uh, you know, just have faith that, you know, it's it's fortunate that the olfactory sense is the first one to fatigue <laughs> when it's in with a strong odor. So, yeah, if you just sort of hang around uh, long enough, it's not going to be that bad. I mean, if you walk... I don't know if you ever walked into a city morgue where the forensic cases are done, but it's overwhelming there. But there are people that spend their lives working there. Yeah. And they don't smell it anymore. Yeah. Just is what it is. What uh, you, you talked a little bit about some of the changes you've seen. Um, do you think that that molecular, um, I forget the specific langu- language you use, but the, the molecular stuff, is that the biggest kind of change that's coming to pathology that that students should be aware of? Yeah, I mean, that's really the only thing that I see that's that's uh, a complete game changer. Uh, the question is, how will pathologists be utilized in interpreting the molecular data? Um, I'm optimistic to think that the molecular pathology is going to actually make going to make us even busier than we are. I don't think we're going to be replaced by it. I think it's just going to be another tool that we use to make the diagnosis. But I see it's always going to be based on morphology at some level and um, pathologists will be necessary to evaluate morphology um, if only to tell the molecular biologist what to analyze. Now, when you talk about molecular, what are you, what specifically are you talking about? Are you talking about potentially instead of looking at a, a specimen on a mi- under a microscope, actually looking at the molecular level of it going, okay, we know this is this type of sarcoma because of the molecular structure. That's right. So many of the uh, neoplasms, especially now that you mentioned sarcomas, many sarcomas have specific chromosomal translocations mm-hmm. that um, are either define the tumor or are important diagnostic criteria. And we use molecular techniques. And when I say molecular, I mean pertaining to DNA, uh, gene 
structure and gene expression. Okay. So, uh, yeah, anything that has to do with DNA and RNA, that's going to be filed under molecular pathology. Okay. Yeah, so as we get better with uh, our genome sequencing and uh, as those get cheaper and faster, they seem to have more and more of an impact on what we're doing in medicine. Absolutely. Very cool. Well, if you had to do it all over again, would you still be a pathologist? Yes. I, I mean, um, I would not have chosen a different specialty. To be honest and totally frank with your with your uh, listeners, um, I wish I had aimed a little higher in choice of med school and residency. So that would be the thing I would encourage students to do. If they think that they can get into a really highly competitive med school on a highly competitive residency, you know, shoot for it. Um, because I think the kind of training you get at the top tier institutions really does pay off. Well, let's, let's talk about that for a second, because it's something that comes up a ton uh, on my, my main show for pre-med students. What, where do you think you've been held back by, by potentially not going to a top tier med- medical school or, or matching into a, a, a top residency program? I think that there were some areas of pathology that I was really weak on when I started practicing and I had to play catch up ball simply because um, the place I trained had deficiencies in attracting certain types of cases. Yeah. Yeah. And it's definitely with my wife as a, as a neurologist, having trained at at Mass General, right? Big, big, huge academic medical center, everything goes to Mass General. And so I can definitely see from a residency perspective, how that potentially, and even as a medical student, potentially your third and fourth years, your clinical rotations, not seeing uh, some of that stuff. And as they say out in the, the medical world, right? If you, if you've never seen it, you can't diagnose it. Yeah, d- having seen it, definitely, it's a great learning tool because you can sit down and read a textbook from cover to cover, and then you know a month later you forgot most of it. But if you have a case and you really have to grind to get that case down, you're never going to forget that. Yeah, interesting. Okay. Any last words of wisdom for the student out there who maybe is thinking about pathology now, knowing that you don't have to not like people to go into it? Um, I would say um, the students that are interested in visual identification things, like when they were kids, maybe they had a a stamp collection and a coin collection and an insect collection and rocks and minerals. People like that, they make really good diagnostic pathologists because they know how to make visual distinctions and how to classify things. So they might, you know, if they have those kind of talents and those kind of interests, they might want to at least take an elective in pathology and see if it's something they'd want to do as a career. All right, there you have it. Again, Dr. Othman talking about anatomic and clinical pathology and or or just call it general pathology, if you will. Hopefully you got a lot of good information out of the podcast today. Hopefully we dispelled the common myth that you have to not like people to be a pathologist. There's a lot of interacting with a lot of different people, a lot of different personalities as a pathologist. So hopefully we got you interested in pathology. And if you are a stamp collector out there, or maybe a baseball card collector, maybe pathology is right for you. I hope you enjoyed our episode today. Please again, share this podcast with your friends, your med school administration with your classmates. We'll see you next time here on Specialty Stories. This is MedEd Media.